former Doctor Who boss Stephen Moffat once said, it is impossible for a show about a dimension hopping time traveller to have a canon. And though it probably would be possible if enough attention was devoted to the task, he's more or less right. It's unrealistic to expect that everything will add up across 60 years of history, and there are few things in the show that can't be waved away by saying time war, or universe reset, cracks in time, showrunner bad, or because Doctor Who. However, these quick and easy explanations don't necessarily excuse the show's inconsistencies, and they certainly don't mean we can't have fun pointing them out. With that in mind then, I'm Ellie with Who Culture, and here are 10 things that make no sense in Doctor Who. Number 10. Pete avoids the void in Doomsday Though Ten and Rose's separation in Doomsday is an emotional tour de force, the mechanics of the sequence don't really hold up if you stop and think about them. The episode's finale revolves around void stuff, a material that the Daleks and Cybermen are saturated in, causing them to be pulled into void when the Doctor opens it up. Crucially though, the Doctor and Rose are also covered in void stuff, so they have to cling to some magnetic clamps to ensure they aren't pulled in too. This works at first, but when Rose's clamp fails, the void sucks her in, sending her spiralling towards her death, until Pete materialises, grabs her, and whisks her away to safety. But hang on a second. An earlier scene showed that Pete, like the Daleks and the Cybermen, is also drenched in void stuff, so when he materialised and snatched Rose, why wasn't he pulled in too? Well, the answer is, there is no answer. Fans have been questioning this one for years, and though Doomsday is an effective episode overall, it is a little odd that such an important moment has this huge hole right through its centre. Number 9. The Doctor's Missing Heart in the Edge of Destruction On several occasions it's been mentioned that Time Lords have two hearts, and this has always been a concrete part of Doctor Who mythology. Or has it? In the opening moments of the first Doctor serial, The Edge of Destruction, the TARDIS goes haywire and the Doctor collapses to the floor. Shortly after, Ian inspects him to make sure he's alright, declaring that his breathing seems regular and that his heart, his one, single heart, is fine. Flash forward to the third Doctor's debut in Spearhead from Space, however, and we see an x-ray of the Doctor that clearly shows two hearts, and that's how it's been for every future episode. All Time Lords have a binary, vascular system. The first Doctor's missing heart has since gone unexplained, and though the obvious answer here is that the production staff hadn't yet thought to give Time Lords a unique biology, there's been little in the way of an in-universe explanation for this inconsistency. Instead, it's generally theorised by fans that Time Lords don't get their second heart until after their first regeneration. Number 8. Amy's Nonsensical Metaphor in Day of the Moon Rory spent a lot of his time in the TARDIS wondering if his wife actually loved him, or whether she was more interested in the dashing 11th Doctor. His fears were kinda understandable considering that she did try to kiss him at their wedding. Amy also liked to toy with Rory's emotions by using ridiculous metaphors that made Rory think she was head over heels for the Doctor rather than for him. Case in point, Day of the Moon moon. When Amy is kidnapped, Rory can only hear her voice, which leads to a moment where she declares her love for an unnamed him, and strongly implies that this individual is the 11th Doctor. And I quote, I love you. I know you think it's him. I know you think it ought to be him, but it's not. It's you. And when I see you again, I'm going to tell you properly just to see your stupid face. My life was so boring before you just dropped out of the sky. So just get your stupid face where I can see it, okay? However, we later learn that Amy is actually talking about Rory here. Writer Stephen Moffat was intending to create some ambiguity about who Amy loved, which is fine, but it's frankly rather stupid that he couldn't think of a better way to do it than dropped out of the sky, a phrase that in no way, shape or form applies to Rory. It's an uncharacteristically nonsensical piece of dialogue from one of Doctor Who's very best writers. Number 7. Nobody mentions Miracle Day in Doctor Who Series 6 Russell T Davies created a cinematic universe before cinematic universes were cool with the triple header of Doctor Who, Torchwood and the Sarah Jane adventures all taking place within the same world and often overlapping with each other. However, this started to cause problems as Torchwood's scale became grander and grander, culminating in the fourth series revolving around a global six-month-long event dubbed Miracle Day, wherein humans stopped dying. This phenomenon affects the entire world, and again, it lasts for half a year. That's a wide reach and a long, long time. 
And yet, it isn't so much as even reference, nor is any evidence of it seen in Doctor Who or the Sarah Jane Adventures, despite several episodes of those shows taking place concurrently with Miracle Day. It's even funnier when you consider the Silence's plan in Series 6 of Doctor Who is to shoot the Doctor dead in April 2011, smack bang in the middle of Miracle Day. Sure, Miracle Day only affects humans, but the Silence couldn't know that for certain, so you'd think they'd be more hesitant about pressing ahead with their Kill the Doctor scheme during this time. Ultimately, the events of Miracle Day were way too big to not be mentioned. It might be the biggest crisis in human history, yet Amy and Rory don't tell the Doctor about it when they're sat on the beach drinking wine. Number 6. The Doctor wanders around Colchester for an entire day in The Lodger. The Lodger opens with the 11th Doctor being thrown out of the TARDIS, which then dematerializes, leaving him behind. A title card then pops up reading one day later, and the Doctor shows up at Craig Owen's house intending to lodge with him while solving an alien mystery. It's an incredibly fun episode that's very easy to just put on and watch, which is probably why people don't bring up this huge, highly questionable plot detail right at the start of the episode. What does the Doctor do for an entire day after his TARDIS kicks him out? Does he just aimlessly wander around Colchester? Sure, he needed to track down the disturbance that caused the TARDIS to go haywire and find some money to give to Craig, but come on, this is the Doctor! Even without his TARDIS, those two tasks should have taken a couple of hours tops. It's obviously not a plot hole, but there's basically a day-long gap here that's completely glossed over. Number 5. The Doctor's blood is the wrong colour in State of Decay The Doctor's missing heart isn't the only time their biology has made no sense. Whether they're getting into a scrap or just gathering cuts and bruises over the course of their heroics, every time the Doctor is wounded, the character's blood is red, just like an ordinary human's. But oddly, there's one occasion in the show where this isn't actually true. The first episode of the fourth Doctor serial, State of Decay, ends with the Doctor getting chomped on by a bat. He touches the wound and gets some blood on his fingers, and there's a quick shot where we can see that his blood, surprisingly, is blue. This is never addressed, mentioned, or seen from again, and from here on out, the Doctor's blood is a bog-standard shade of red. So what happened here? Well, word is that Tom Baker felt that the Doctor, as a member of the Gallifreyan aristocracy, should have blue blood, signifying his importance. In real-world history, people of noble birth are sometimes referred to as blue-blooded. It's also said that showrunner John Nathan Turner wasn't told about this and that he was cheesed off when he found out, which is why the scene is edited in such a way to mask the blood as much as possible. Whether or not that story is true, the fact is that the Doctor has always had red blood, both before State of Decay and after. So let's just forget this happened, shall we? Number 4. The Statue of Liberty could take over the world in The Angels Take Manhattan Weeping Angels creator Stephen Moffat has received a ton of flack for making their law more and and more complicated. And though the iconic statues are among the show's most entertaining villains, it does feel like they were at their best in Blink, when they were stripped back, simple and scarily effective. One particular development that irks many fans is the whole an image of an angel becomes itself an angel thing, first mentioned in Series 5's The Time of Angels. This means that drawings, photographs and video clips of angels aren't just basic images, they're real angels, and they can leap out of the frame and attack you. A lot has been said about how this retroactive created problems with Blink's ending, which shows that Sally Sparrow has several images of angels in her possession. But the real doozy here is the fact that the Statue of Liberty, which in The Angels Take Manhattan is revealed to be an angel, is a worldwide icon, appearing on postcards, shirts, mugs and lunchboxes around the globe. So if all these images can turn into angels, then Shouldn't the Earth be under attack from millions of pieces of Liberty merch? Maybe Moffat forgot to address this, or maybe he just didn't care. But either way, Lady Liberty Conquers the World sounds like a kick-ass idea for an episode. Number 3. The Flux is Stopped by Matter except when it isn't, in The Vanquishers. Series 13 of Doctor Who revolved around the Flux, an enormous hungry cloud that devoured anything and everything in its path. As the series progresses, we learn that the Flux is composed of antimatter, and that it was created by Tech Taeyun as part of a moustache-twirling evil scheme. The 13th Doctor soon determines that the only way to stop the Flux is to essentially feed it, putting enough matter in its way to combat the antimatter. It's a sound theory, and even better, for not the episode The Vanquishers shows us that it works, with the Doctor using the endless space inside a passenger to absorb every last drop of the flux. The only problem here is that if matter is what halts the flux, then why wasn't it slowed down or stopped earlier in the series? 
In the very first episode, we see it eat countless planets and billions of life forms. It also rips through Vinda's space station and later on it even has a munch on some Dalek and Cybermen fleets. The Sontarans seem to think that those fleets will stop the flux all by themselves, so it doesn't make sense that a bunch of planets wouldn't also get the job done. Number 2. Everything about the Sonic Screwdriver The Sonic Screwdriver began life as a humble device with limited functions. Hell, early in the show it was just that, a screwdriver and the Doctor never relied on it too much throughout the course of his adventures. Over time though, the Sonic has evolved into an all-encompassing plot device that essentially does what the writers need it to, with no explanation necessary for its endless array of outlandish, bizarre functions. It can fire off energy, it can turn regular glasses into sunglasses, it can blow things up, it can disarm people who are holding guns, and it even has a built-in pen. Fans don't tend to complain about this one much though, because it's now just expected that the Sonic can just do stuff. And we aren't complaining either, we love the Sonic, it's great. But you can't deny that every last shred of its logic and reason has been tossed out of the window over the last 20 years. Number 1. The inconsistent destruction of the space Titanic in turn left. With the Doctor in a body bag, Turn Left's alternate Earth is in a terrible state. There's a new crisis every five minutes, mostly due to the fact that various alien races are having an absolute field day now that the planet's main protector is gone. It's a total crap fest, but even so, it should have been much worse. There's a moment in the episode where a spacey wacy replica of the Titanic crashes into London, completely destroying the city. Countless lives are lost and southern England is flooded with radiation. Needless to say, it's bad. In the regular timeline though, seen in the 2007 Christmas special Voyage of the Damned, the Doctor is alive to prevent this disaster, which is a bloody relief because in that episode it's stated that the Titanic will destroy the planet if it crashes to the surface, taking the entire human population with it. So why does only London get destroyed when the Titanic crashes in turn left? Even though Russell T Davies wrote both episodes, the show doesn't give us any hard evidence to explain this plot hole away. So I guess we'll just have to go with it. And that concludes our list. If you can think of any other moments that make no sense, then do let us know in the comments below. And while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe and tap that notification bell. Also head over to Twitter and follow us there, and I can be found across various social medias just by searching Ellie Littlechild. I've been Ellie with Who Culture, and in the words of River Song herself, goodbye, sweetie.